Guys, I gotta be honest, 9% of my videos feature cars from the HD 4000 series and I am getting sick of them. They were good back in 2008, but have aged poorly, don't perform well, and are actually e-waste. Anyway, today we're gonna be taking a look at the HD 4670. Most would start by trying to paint the card in a good light, but I'm gonna tell you what I don't like about it, which is that it only supports up to DirectX 10. See, I was raised in an era where DirectX 12 was the gold standard that every card supported, but back in the early 2000s, they were switching these things out every year or so. The problem with the 4000 series is that it released a year before DirectX 11 came out and only supports up to DirectX 10, and since most modern games only support DX11 and 12, this card has been outdated for a long time. The upside to these older cards is that they're cheap and you can really overclock them. Like, you can overclock newer cards, but they have far too many fail safes to make it not dangerous, and that's no fun, so I like cranking these to the max instead. The 4670 was released as a mid-range card and wasn't anything special. It served its purpose and had its place in the market, but it didn't exactly leave its mark on GPU history. It was just your run-of-the-mill card that you would upgrade from after about 5 years. This is where things get a bit more complicated, as it actually had a couple different versions. So, the original standard 4670 by ATI had half a gig of VRAM, but for some reason they decided to release a 4670X2 that had 2 gigs of VRAM and two of these RV730 processors on a single PCB. See, that's a cool concept, but in reality you're getting two mid-range processors with enthusiast level pricing. This Newegg review accurately sums it up as a waste of money that's worse than the 4770 that also costs much less. It only really existed because it had four DVI ports and could power four monitors, except it could barely even do that. The next year, ATI released the 4670 AGP edition that had one gigabyte of VRAM and was actually one of the last and most powerful AGP graphics cards, but AGP began getting phased out five years prior, so it didn't really have much of a future. It also apparently had bad driver support. And on top of all that, there were four different versions of this exact XFX 4670. They had slightly different GPU and memory clock speeds, but they should perform similarly. So what exactly did $80 worth of GPU get you back in 2008? Well, the one I have came with 8 render output units, 32 texture mapping units, a core clock of 750MHz, and 1GB of Samsung DDR2 memory clocked at 400MHz. Yeah, there's not a lot to work with there. After cleaning the card up, I threw it in my test system with 16GB of RAM and an i3-4130. Driver installation in Windows 7 went without a hitch, so I decided to test a few different games. The first game I tried running was GTA 5, which is like the gold standard for graphics card benchmarks on YouTube. In 720p with the lowest settings, the card managed to get an average frame rate of 18 FPS. That's not ideal, so I dropped the resolution a little more. Yep, that's right, GTA 5 can run on the 4670, just in a resolution of 800 by 600 with the lowest settings. It was able to get an average frame rate of 33, which is a lot better, but also still unplayable because you can't really see what's going on. The next game was CSGO, which unsurprisingly performed a lot better. It was stable at about 40 FPS and 720p with the lowest settings, and because of this I decided to try out 1080p. Now this wasn't a good idea because after this my capture card stopped working in resolutions higher than 1280 by 720 I ended up recording it on my phone, but you're not really missing out on much because anything higher doesn't run too well on this card. Next up was 2014's Insurgency. In terms of a good looking game that ran well, this is probably the best out of any I tested with this card. In 720p with the lowest settings, it managed to get an average frame rate of 40 FPS. However, this was prone to a lot of fluctuation, especially in gunfights, which proved to be quite detrimental. Following that was Portal 2. In 720p with medium settings, this game ran the best out of any tested today and got an average of 62 FPS. Because of this, I also tested it in 1080p with the low settings where it got an average frame rate of 51. This game came out 3 years after the 4670, so to see it still pulling near 60 FPS is surprisingly good. The final game I tested at stock speeds was Dishonored 2. Like the other games, I played this one in 720p with the lowest settings where it did alright. It didn't stutter or really lose frames as the action picked up, but the average frame rate was only 29 FPS. This card actually does meet the minimum system requirements for this game, so I was a bit disappointed that the frame rate wasn't a bit higher, but it still was playable. Due to this general lackluster performance, I decided to try out some overclocking and hop back into some GTA 5. I was able to get it stable at 780MHz on the core and 560MHz on the memory, which brought the average frame rate from 18 to 24 FPS. But you could definitely push it further. I only spent about 10 minutes fine tuning the card, so some performance was left on the table. But in 720p with the lowest settings, it ran sort of playably.
Now, the games I tested did all release a few years after the 4670, which does mean that the card was a little bit out of his comfort zone. But it honestly held up pretty well, especially considering that it has long surpassed his life expectancy. On a side note, I'd like some capture card recommendations. I bought this one because I had DVI, which I need for these older graphics cards, but its usage has been pretty hit or miss. Regardless, that just about wraps up the video. Consider leaving a like, commenting, or even subscribing because it genuinely helps me out. Thanks. Bye.